Hello, I'm Evan Morgan, and welcome to another in our series of conversations. I'm excited today to have Larry Crabb with us. Uh, many of you will know uh, the name of Larry Crabb. He's uh, uh, a well-known author and speaker and psychologist. He's um, the co-founder of The Larger Story, and we'll be talking about that in just a moment and uh, hear a bit more about that in one of our sessions. He's also the founder of New Way uh, Ministries several years ago. Many of you will know that he has his PhD in clinical psychology. And above all, he just helps us understand how to talk with each other. He's uh, had these kinds of conversations with me over the years. I've been blessed to, uh, to get to know him and have the kinds of meaningful conversations that we want to talk about today. That's our subject, meaningful conversations. So Larry, welcome. We're glad you're with us today. Well, I'm glad to be with you, Evan. It's uh, old times here, but I'm glad we're reliving again. <laughs> Many times we, Larry and I have sat over a cup of coffee and just shared life's uh, victories and struggles. And uh, that's why it's been so fun to have uh, my relationship with Larry over the years and now to be able to share it with you as we discuss meaningful conversations. And I should say that uh, as we, uh, talk about this, you may find that you have more interest, want to go a bit deeper. Actually, Larry's courses that we call Soul Care are actually some of the most popular courses that we have at our Daily Bread University, which is at a website, christianuniversity.org. And this is how we describe uh, at the beginning of the course. It says, um, this series of courses is designed to help you enter people's interior lives, interior lives at a meaningful level and make a lasting difference as they deal with life's struggles and crises. So today, Larry, we're talking about meaningful conversations, the kind of conversations that you and I have had over the years. And when I began to develop this course with you, you broke this down into four areas that people can uh, discuss together. You use this metaphor about people uh, that often will sit and stare out into space, you tell them, turn your chairs toward each other, begin mm -hmm. to have a meaningful conversation. And then you break it into four categories, to know, explore, discover, and touch one another. And as you and I have had these conversations over the years, I realize that's been a model of what's actually happened in our own conversations. And I'm really excited for you to just share what that means with our folks that are watching today. Know, explore, discover, touch, the core of meaningful conversations. Can you go into that a bit and just tell us a little bit about what each one of those are and how to have a meaningful conversation? Yeah, I appreciate that, Evan. I think those are four words that suggest ways to have a, an important conversation. I like to use the phrase, conversations that matter. And before I get into those four in just a moment, let me just say one thing about a conversation that has been memorable that I've had with you. It was a number of years ago. We were sitting at Ted, Ted's uh, hamburger place, whatever it is, and I got a phone call. Maybe you recall this time. I got a phone call from my doctor telling me that my cancer was not in good shape, that I had cancer and it was not a good thing. And I got off the phone after hearing that and was looking rather pale, I suppose. Um, and then I shared with you what it was. And I'll never forget your response. You didn't try to fix me. You didn't try to help me. You wanted to be with me. And what you simply said really kind of summarizes all these four words in just a phrase. I'll develop that a little more in a minute. But your phrase to me was, Larry, what, what's happening in you right now? And I remember that was an incredibly important phrase. And I had to pause because I didn't expect that. I thought you'd probably say, oh, I'm praying for you. Sorry about that. But you didn't do that. You said, well, what's, what's happening in you? And I remember just thinking about it for a moment. And I said, it's so strange, but the word important seems alive in my soul right at this moment. And that led to a conversation. And the conversation really mattered. Even as I'm sharing this, I'm feeling a little bit of a excited tingle as I think about that conversation. So I really want, I want to really emphasize that anybody, don't have to be a psychologist, actually being a psychologist gets in the way sometimes, I think, because you try to be, be professional, Dr. Crabb will now treat you, as opposed to, I'm a guy that stumbles along with you, let's talk together. So the four words, you know, explore, discover, and touch, when I think about no, um, my, my mind goes to the idea that when I'm sitting with somebody, I, I want to, first of all, realize 
that this person actually bears the image of a relational God. And that means they long for relationships. They really want to be known at the level of interaction, want somebody to be looking toward them. And if there's one word that stands out the most about the what it means to be there as a knowing person or somebody who wants to know, it's the word curiosity. Uh, I really tend to think that that's kind of a lost art in our culture today, including our Christian culture. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. As opposed to, I'd like to know you better. What is, what is the attitude of, cur of curiosity that you have? You're looking at somebody, as C.S. Lewis once said, that if you could see them in their eternal state, you either couldn't bear the sight or you'd be tempted to worship. You're talking to an image bearer who has an incredible destiny ahead, and you can move them and you can help follow the spirit in moving them in one direction or the other. So number one, just think about the importance of this person, the value that they have, the potential that they have. And just if you really want to know, as opposed to trying to come up with the right technique, but if you really want to know, your curiosity is going to be evident as you begin interacting with them. And that's, uh, I just know that you, you mentioned this too, and I think we all feel it in our conversations. A lot of people say, I just don't know what to say. So you just kind of try to gloss over it or change the subject or tell you I'm praying for you, whatever. But there is something you and I have talked about is just getting to that level of saying, this is important. That was, I do remember your statement back then. And I thought, wow, that's an interesting word that this is important. I'm not sure if you mentioned a cancer diagnosis to many people, you think oh, this is important. So it was important. And for you to be able to then, we could then begin to explore that and just say, yeah. I have enough interest that I want to hear more. Yes. Exactly right. And the second word, explore, um, no explore, discover and touch. When I think of explore, I, I think of something that does not come naturally to me and doesn't come naturally to anybody. And even my training as a psychologist didn't really encourage me to go in this direction to some degree. But the direction I want to suggest uh, when you think about exploring is ask open ended questions. Don't ask questions with an agenda. Um, how often do you hear somebody say, well, don't you think such and such, which is a way of saying, I really think you want to think this way. Do you or do you not? And <laughs> it's just very, very different to ask an open-ended question, such as, you know, as again, you asked of me when I said important, you, you asked an open-ended question. What, what do you mean by that? As opposed to, yeah, I guess that would sound important to you. No, you asked a question. And it's got to be open without an agenda. And I think that's a very crucial thing to think about when you're talking about exploring because there's a world that's going on beneath the surface and everybody has it. And when I have, when I've been doing a lot of counseling, when I was doing it professionally and now when I'm doing it in coffee shops and just chatting with people, uh, I'm very aware that their mind is always going somewhere. And sometimes I'll just sit there quietly and not say a word. And that often gives the person an opportunity to feel like they're heard, like somebody's with them, and then where they really are inside that they don't usually share starts coming out. And that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the exploring process. I want to know what's going on, um, and not in a meddling way, uh, but I want to know it because I'm interested in your potential as a person. And I'm interested in what the Lord could do in your life. And so let's get real about where you are. And let me just be opening questions that are opened as opposed to shutting down questions. And, and I think that makes a huge difference. And I think the other thought that I'd share about the importance of this, it's an old cliche of mine, but I kind of like it, so I'll say it again, <laughs> that God meets us where we are, not where we pretend to be. Mm. And he meets us where we are, not where we wish we were. Um, and even this morning, if we were sitting over coffee now and had a couple hours, I might even say to you something like this, Devin, I will, and this is true actually, I woke up this morning and I really felt this kind of bored, um, indifferent. And I thought, all right, got to get up, get a shower, you know, go out for breakfast and I'll do whatever I have to do. Um, but I, I began to realize that there's, there's more going on in me there. And, but, but rather than running away from my sense of indifference, I found myself as I was taking a shower and actually driving to my morning breakfast spot, I just found myself saying, God meets me where I am. So let me tell him where I am right now. God, I'm just not excited about much of anything at the moment. And by just sharing that rather openly without trying to pretend, hey, I'm a Christian man. I can really be full of life today and feel full of excitement. Something inside actually began to shift. And maybe mm -hmm. we'll talk about this later. But I had an incredible, 
almost 30 minute conversation with one of my waitresses this morning um, that just kind of got me all excited about life again. It was really wonderful. So explore, ask open-ended questions, be with the person. That's the, that's the idea of explore, which I think is not a common way of relating. We're trying to fix typically. How can I fix you? How can I pray for you? Well, those are legitimate things. You want people help and you want people to be prayed for. But before you get, a lot of our prayers are premature. And what I mean by that, we don't know what we're praying about until mm -hmm. we hear what's going on in the person. So open-ended questions, I think, are very important. You've mentioned, I think you've used the metaphor that you talk about looking looking for what's below the surface, and you've used the metaphor of an iceberg, that what we're yeah. seeing on the top is the things that we want to share, but there's much more that's going on beneath the surface. As you said in your own illustration this morning, you you yourself had to do some exploration as to there's more to this than just feeling bored. And in that process of the conversation, I assume that's what you're saying we we want to do. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I do think that's one of the things that I learned in my training, that there really is more going on beneath the surface. And the largest part of the iceberg is hidden beneath the waterline. And so I often talk about when I, when I talk to people about how to have conversations, explore beneath the waterline. Explore beneath the waterline into all that's going on in the soul that bears the image of God, that longs for relationship, that has the problem all of us have, kind of a natural self-centeredness, a natural self-protectiveness. But if I can be a safe person for somebody else, curious and interested with a vision for who they could become, then maybe they'll be willing to dip down beneath the waterline and let me meet them at that level. And those are the first two words in my mind. Now, how do you, and this maybe gets into the next um, area of discover, but how do you sense when someone is willing to have that level of conversation? Because I assume there's times where you begin to explore and discover that you sense this person is not willing or ready. How are you sensing it? I'm sure the spirit is a big, spirit of God is a big part of this. Um, what takes place when you're beginning to ask those kinds of open-ended questions? One of the, one of the things that I think is important in having a, a conversation that matters is um, don't try to make something happen. Mm. Um, what, what often does happen, I think, is, as you mentioned earlier, that we get in a conversation with somebody, and almost everybody, certainly including me, we feel inadequate. Um, do I really know what I'm doing? Even when I trained and I come in as a licensed PhD psychologist, I still felt really, really inadequate. I hope my surgeon doesn't feel this way, um, but, I, but I sure do. And, and sometimes I'm, I'm really working more to prove that I have something to offer as opposed to waiting upon the spirit to do his work. And so if I'm running up against a wall and I'm trying to know and be curious and wanting to explore a little bit and I hit a, hit a wall, rather than feeling threatened by that, can I learn what it means to be patient with the Spirit's work in somebody else? And perhaps just to be quiet or maybe even to observe something like, doesn't sound like you want to talk about this right now, and I'm really okay with that. Mm -hmm. And even taking that as a disarming sentence can sometimes open people up. But it sometimes doesn't open people right up. And you got to be confident that the Spirit of God is always working, but you might not have the opportunity to be a part of it in this particular conversation. And you got to be free like in haggling with a car salesman, you got to be free of being able to walk out without buying the car. Mm. And you got to be free to walk out of a conversation without having made the difference you long to make. You got to be comfortable with that or you're going to be forcing yourself on somebody else. And that's never going to get to where the real issues are. You've mentioned that to me before. I tell you that helps so much in conversations, Larry, because it's very freeing. You, you, you're not, it's not you that's you know, quote, fixing someone. <laughs> it's the spirit. And so there's a sense in which you can release that under the spirit's guidance. Now, is yeah. that, how does that then relate and maybe to distinguish between discover and touch? We've talked about know, explore. What's the, how do we distinguish between discover and touch? Well, I think you're making the right point that these four words that I've come up with are not airtight categories. And you'd um, you know spend the first 20 minutes um, knowing, and then the next 15, next 15 minutes is exploring. I, I don't believe that at all. These are just four categories. I like to call them categories of understanding that can mm. guide you in a conversation. But don't be don't be locked into them. Just be thinking about them. It's very different. 
when you get to the third category, now explore and now discover, um, what, what, you're, what you need to be assuming and what you need to be thinking about is the Spirit of God really is always on duty and he's always doing something. I think about the Philippians 1 to 6 passage where Paul says that this, the good work that God begun has begun, he is continuing now until when he completes it in the day of Jesus Christ. But for now, before the day of Christ, when he returns, there's something going on, and I might not have a chance to touch into that. But can I envision a vision? Can I get a vision for what it would look like in somebody else um, for them to share something that really is coming from, from their new heart, their Christian heart, their desire to, to love the Lord and love others? What, what can I discern um, can, can I discover something that is evidence of the Spirit's work in their life? Or, in a contrary way, and I don't want this to sound terribly negative, can I discover certain attitudes that are, that are quenching and are blocking and are grieving the work of the Spirit? I've got to be thinking about a vision for the kind of life that is only possible because of what Jesus has made possible. Mm. And if I have that kind of a highfalutin view, then, then maybe I'll be able to hear something that really just kind of can I put it this way crudely, kind of smells like the work of the Spirit mm -hmm. or smells like the flesh getting in the way of the work of the Spirit? And that's what I mean by discovering. Can I discover how the Spirit is being quenched right now? Can I discover how the Spirit is moving right now? And just be a, a sensitive to underlining in your own mind those two things as are happening. And then once you have some glimpse of either one of those two, then you can move to the, to the touch category. And when I think of the word touch, I have a very simple phrase that I think makes sense to me when I'm chatting with people, is what is alive in me at the moment? Um, what, what is going on in me? What is the spirit making alive? And I have a couple of caveats with this because sometimes I th I'll think of something and I'll think, oh my gosh, that was really brilliant. I can't wait to show off how brilliant I am and tell the people this marvelous insight. <laughs> and if you, if you do have a sense of, something's alive in me and I really want to say it so I can let somebody know that I'm really good at this, then don't say it. Um, you, you've got to be a little bit more discerning to say, well, this feels really alive in me. Whose sake is, for whose sake is this? Uh, if I share it, is it's really because I'm concerned with the well-being of the other. Does that feel clean to me? And if it does, then go ahead and, and make the comment. Um, as I was talking with uh, this uh, waitress this morning, the server, I could go into this in some detail, but I won't at the moment. But uh, toward, toward the end of our conversation, she was sharing she's a single mom. She has a terrible background, very painful background. She's got three kids. And um, she was just sharing so many of the struggles. And I just made some comment along the way about, you know, I just wonder how God looks down on this your difficult situation. I wonder what that's like for you to think about that. And she said, oh, I've been draw so, so, drawn so close to God because of my grandmother. Well, that opened a whole lot more. And then it turned out that she has really got some strength in her as a woman who's been through so much. And I said, you know, given what you've been through, you really become a very strong woman in a wonderful sense. I can't imagine how delighted God is with you right now. Mm -hmm. And that was alive in me. And that wow. was a matter of touching. And when she said that, when I said that, she teared up and kind of looked at me in a very kind of a sweet little girl way almost. And she said, well, thank, thank you for saying that. <laughs> and um, that was pretty much the end of the conversation. I left feeling, thank you, Lord. That was a really good time. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, you, you, God puts these relationships in our path all the time. The last time I played golf, as you were speaking, I was thinking, when has that happened recently with me? And I thought, you know, that just happened recently. I'm playing golf. We're whopping up the 18th hole, a gentleman that I have met once or so. And he's having a mostly a bad round and slamming his club down and it's all about the golf and whatever. And we're walking up and he just walks next to me and he says, you know, actually, I just feel stress all the time. I slept hmm. three hours last night. And I thought, Lord, what is it that you are wanting me to do with this? And I did yes. a simple question. I said, well, what's going on inside of you? Yes. He started to share, and then he had to go hit his next shot. <laughs> we didn't have a chance, but those kinds of opportunities, I'm going to play golf with him again at some point. It'll give me an opportunity to use this process, or this, as you say, this category, and just help me. What's going on? Why did he share that after a bad round and just choose to walk up beside me out of the blue and say this? Yeah. Well, I, that's the spirit, I think, beginning to 
say, all right, here's someone that wants to, to talk and have a meaningful conversation. And I think a sentence as simple as what you said has a profoundness to it. I wonder what's going on in you right now. Um, what's going on? And again, to repeat something I said earlier, because it feels so much a part of my struggles, and I think most of our struggles, that there's sometimes the hesitation in me of wanting to hear what's really going on in somebody else, because I might have no idea what to do with that. Mm. Mm. So let me just keep things at a little easier level so I can, uh, I can maintain my sense of competence at having a good conversation. Um, and I've often said that you're not having a good conversation until you're out of your league, <laughs> until you're dealing with things that you haven't got a clue what to do with. And then you realize that you're really alive in this moment and there's something in you because of the spirit of God that really would want to know about this person as opposed to protect yourself from looking like an idiot. Um, and when you're kind of, can kind of reject that self-protection mentality, then you're going to be with the person. Now, when I, when I teach these week long courses that I do and what's on the video series that you're talking about on soul care, um, one of the most important words in this whole thing is the word with. I just want to capitalize all four letters, W-I-T-H, with. What does it mean to be with somebody where they are as opposed to keeping myself safe from, buddy, from somebody where I don't know what to do if they share certain things? And all of us feel inadequate to some level, but the idea of just being with and wanting to know, it just reflects the fact that you maybe you're growing to be a little bit more like Jesus who really cares about other people. This person says, I'm disillusioned with God to the point that I'm ready to walk away from my faith. If there is a God at all, he isn't working for me. Hopelessness is probably an understatement with how I feel. Tough conversation to start with. Larry, help us help that person through that. <laughs> You're expecting me to know how to talk to that person, are you? 